We're going to be working with structural pseudo-class selectors. These selectors allow you to target elements based on more complex patterns within the DOM. Now what that means is that you can target elements based on conditions like whether or not they are the first child of an element or whether they're the only child of an element or other factors. Structural pseudo class selectors allow you to do really complex targeting without using any class or ID attributes. So they can be really helpful in many situations. It gives you a little bit more flexibility with your HTML coding. I'm going to show you the code that we're going to start working with. This is the page as it exists right now and it just is a page that has some information about pseudoclass elements and structural pseudoclass elements. The HTML for this page is as follows. I'm using embedded styles and I just have some basic styles. We'll look at those in just a moment. Let me share the HTML with you first. I start off and within the body I have a header tag that contains an H1 then I have an article tag and the article tag actually wraps around all of the rest of the content except for the footer down at the bottom and the article tag contains a series of section tags so this first section ends right here and it has also an H1 a paragraph a block quote with a paragraph another paragraph another block quote and then I have a second section which contains an H2 and a paragraph and some more block quotes and then it has another H2 within the section and then if we come down here I have a third section which also contains an H2 and some paragraphs of text and then I finally have one more section that just has a paragraph of text and then I close my article and then I have a footer the CSS that I'm currently using is pretty basic. I'm specifying my HTML5 elements and telling them to display as block. I have a universal selector. On the body, I just have some margin settings. I've set an overall width to constrain my content from only being 700 pixels. I'm setting a font family throughout. On my article, I have some padding. Block quotes, unordered lists, and ordered lists are going to contain margins. I have some rules for my paragraphs, for my H1s, my H2s. I have a more specific rule for my header H1 that's going to make this one look different. It makes the background dark gray and the text white and whatnot. And then I have some rules on my footer. So once again, this is what the page looks like. Here's that first H1 that exists with the header. Here's another H1. And then as I mentioned, there's paragraphs, block quotes. There's an H2 right here and you can see that one of the rules I have on my H2 is to put an underline underneath the text so that exists on all of the H2 elements that I have and then here's my footer down below so that's what we're gonna start working with what we'll do is we'll begin by making some additional CSS and this will introduce you to some of the structural pseudo class elements I'm gonna begin by creating a root pseudo class element that will target all root elements which basically is going to target the HTML element so just this is another way of targeting the HTML element I'm going to just type colon root and then I'll open my curly brace and end my curly brace it is worth noting that with pseudo class selectors the syntax is always a colon followed by the pseudo class name so in this case we're just gonna put colon root now sometimes if you want to target a specific element, you'll append the element to the beginning of the pseudo class syntax and I'll show you how we can do this as we go on. Other pseudo class elements will allow you to pass on numeric values and again we'll talk more about this as we build this page. So I'm going to start by the root which is going to target the HTML element and I'm going to begin by setting the background of my page to an image that I have in my image directory. So I'm going to use URL and I have a repeating image that I've already created. It's called BG1 and I'll go ahead and save my page and if we look you're going to just find that there's a repeating background that's going to appear. Now because my background is kind of dark it's going to make my text a little difficult to see. So I'm going to go ahead and apply a background color to the body tag. Remember that we already set the body tag to have a width of 700 pixels. So I um, 
we don't see that right now, but once we put a background color, that will become more apparent. Now I'm going to go ahead and just use background color and the background color that I'm going to use is going to have some opacity on it. So I am going to use RGBA as the value for my color. This stands for red, green, blue, and the A stands for alpha. We'll work more with RGBA in a future exercise, but for now just know that this is another way that you can specify color. So instead of putting a hex value or a keyword name for the color you can actually plug in RGB values and then if you wanted to add alpha which is going to give you some transparency you can add the A and pass that on. The color I want is going to be white but I just want it to be a 50 percent white so the RGB values for white are 255 for red, green, and blue and I separate these values by commas and then I'm going to put 0.5 which is the same as indicating 50 percent. This is going to allow the background color to be partially transparent so we'll see a little bit through that. I'm also going to add a rounded corner so I'm going to use border radius and that's one of our CSS3 selectors and the border radius that I'm going to pass on is going to be 8 pixels. If you are targeting older browsers you may want to check caniuse.com and make sure that the browsers that you're targeting support border radius. If they don't you might have to use vendor prefixes so you would add the dash moz dash border radius dash webkit dash border radius but for our purposes here we don't need to do that so I'm just gonna put border radius but I did want to point it out. When I preview in the browser now you can see that now my body tag has what looks like a light kind of purple color but really it's because this background white is partially transparent so if you look carefully you can actually see the pattern from my background image kind of showing through now down here I see the rounded corners on the bottom of my page up here I don't the reason that we see the rounded corners on the bottom is because I have a rule on my footer which sets the border radius to 0 for the left, 0 for the right, these are top, and then 8 pixels for the left bottom, 8 pixels for the right top. I didn't set any border radius on the header so that particular element is by default creating a squared edge at the top and that's fine that's what I want to do but I just wanted to point it out to you. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to make a rule for my second block quote. This is wrapped inside of a block quote. So if we go into the HTML, you can see here's my block quote tag and it contains this paragraph of text. I would like this text to appear in two columns instead of one. So I'm going to use a CSS3 property called column count to be able to create those two columns. And let me just take you to the Can I Use website. You can search any of the properties here just to see what the support is. So if I search for column count, you can see that it's going to show me the CSS3 multiple column layout and then it gives me a chart which is going to show me support for this particular property. The green color indicates support so IE 10 and 11 and future versions of IE support it. IE 9 does not support this. These areas where it has the kind of limey green color they indicate that these browsers have partial support so you can see that Firefox, Chrome, Safari, Opera, iOS, Safari, etc. pretty much they all have partial support. That means that you need to include those vendor prefixes to be able to have this rule function in these versions of the browsers. So if we just use the standard column count rule, it's not going to work in our modern browsers except for the versions of IE listed here and Opera Mini. The other browsers are still going to need us to include the vendor prefix. And if you scroll down here, you can get more information about this. You can click on known issues and this will let you know 
in Firefox, the property column span, column count, whatever, it doesn't work yet. So these are things that you can find out more information about. So this is a really handy website, caniuse.com, because you can check and make sure that whatever it is that you're choosing is supported or it'll let you know what you need to do so that you have support. So for this particular property, I'm going to make sure that I do use my vendor prefixes since I have to have them to gain support in a majority of the browsers. I will go ahead and make a rule here and my rule is going to be a block quote but I only want my second block quote affected by this rule. I don't want the first one affected. I'm going to use a pseudo class called nth of type. And nth of type will allow me to pass on a numerical value. And in this case, I'm going to pass on two inside of my parentheses, which is going to indicate that this rule is going to affect the second block quote. So whenever it reaches my page, it, as soon as it reaches the second one, it's going to go ahead and use this rule and I'm going to use column count and I'm going to tell the column count to be 2 and as I mentioned we need to put our vendor prefixes so I'll just copy this and I'll put the vendor prefixes first I'm going to do webkit dash and I'll add column count 2 then I'm going to add dash moz dash for the Mozilla based browsers and do column count of 2 as well if I save the page and we go look in the browser and we refresh, you can now see that this block quote is going to display in two columns. So that column count worked. And let me just show you really quickly. If I didn't have the vendor prefixes there and we save the page, you can see that it doesn't work. And I'm using a newer version of Chrome, but it doesn't work. So I definitely need to include those vendor prefixes in order to ensure that this page is going to display in the manner that I want it to in the modern browsers. So this nth of type selector allows me to be more specific without having to use a class name or an ID or anything like that. It just is because it's the second block quote that appears on my page, that's what I passed on, and it's going to take on that formatting. The next thing that we're going to do on our page is the very last the very last paragraph in my final section, I want this one to display a little bit differently. I want it to be italic and I want to center the text. And that's just because it's kind of like summing up some information about pseudo class selectors. So in order to target that last, and if we look real quickly, you can see that here's my section and this is the paragraph that's within that last section. So this is the last section on my page. In order to target that last section and only that last section, I'm going to use a pseudo class selector as well. So we're going to come in here and I'm going to make a selector for section colon last dash child and then I'll open my curly braces like so. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tell the text align to be center and the font style to be italic. If we save and we go look in the browser, you're going to now see that this last paragraph is formatted differently. And that's the only place on my page that that last paragraph is going to be formatted like this. And once again, that's because I'm targeting the very last section that I have on my page by using section last child. So it just goes to the last section on the page and it's going to format the text in this manner. The next thing that I'm going to do is when I introduce a beginning of a new section with an H2, like right here, I want to have the formatting like this with the underline showing like so. But this H2, numeric values, is actually part of the section tag that wraps around all of this. And it actually is talking about pseudo class syntax. It's just being a little bit more specific about numeric values. So I don't want this one to have the underline. So once again, we're going to use a pseudo class selector to be able to get there. And let me just show you the code real quickly. Here is this section, it has an H2 that talks about pseudo class syntax and then I have some information on the page and then I have another 
H2 right here, which talks about numeric values. Both of these H2s are contained inside of the same section tag. So you can see that section tag ends down here. So I only want the first one to get that underline. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a more specific selector type to be able to accomplish that. So I'll put this rule right here where I'm talking about H tags. I'm going to use H2 first of type. So what this selector is allowing us to do is it's saying, okay, go ahead and take a look at the H2. Find all the H2s and then look and see when they are inside of another element, inside of a parent element. Well, when they're the first H2 within that param parent element, then style them in a particular way and then ignore all the other ones that come after. I am going to use the border bottom that I have currently on my regular H2. I'll cut that rule right there and we're just going to put it on the H2 for first of type. So when I save the page, when I come into the browser, as soon as I click refresh, you're going to notice that numeric values is going to lose that bottom border right there. So you can see that that just goes away. So now it's only targeting H2s that are the first of a particular type inside the parent element. Here's another H2, but this one now is inside another section tag. So it still gets the formatting with the underline, as does this one. But this one right here, which is the second H2 inside of a parent element, is no longer going to get that formatting. So that is kind of nice. That's what we want to do right there. And the last thing that I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use a rule just so I can demo this. There are other ways that we could do this, but I'm going to use it anyways right here. Down here at the very bottom, this is a my footer area and it has a paragraph that has this text right here. I do not want this last paragraph to inherit the margin bottom that I have as a general rule for my p tags. And granted, I could just make a more specific rule that said footer space p and target this, but we're going to use the only child pseudo class just so we can practice making those a little bit more. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to make a rule for footer and then I'm going to say p only child. So the only child pseudo class is going to target an element that is the only child of its parent. So that means the parent element contains only one other element. So I'm going to go ahead and write margin bottom of zero here. And when I save and refresh, you're going to notice a little bit of spacing at the very bottom is going to disappear. So that just got a little smaller. So I remove the margin on the bottom on the paragraph when it's an only child of a footer. So if I had another footer tag somewhere else on my page, let's just make one really quick so I can show you this. Let's just say at the bottom of one of my other sections right here. So I'm going to come to this next the last section and we're gonna make a footer element and inside that footer we're gonna make a p tag and then we're just going to create another p tag and I'll save my page so this footer right here has two children in it if we go back into the browser and we refresh you can see that this p tag right here and I'll inspect this with my developer tools just so you can really see what's happening here if we look at this p tag right here you can see that orange that's actually the margin that's on the bottom of that particular element so both of these elements have that orange they have that 1m of margin on the bottom but this guy right here doesn't have it and that's because our rule is pretty specific by using the pseudo class selector and saying we're only going to apply the margin bottom of zero if the footer has only one paragraph child. When a footer has more than one paragraph child, this rule is ignored. So you can see by using these pseudo class selectors, we can get a little bit more specific and it prevents us from having to use a bunch of class and IDs to target the various elements on the page. In the next exercise we're going to work more with some other types of structural pseudo class selectors.